Why are you running? Well, I'm running because we have an incredible opportunity to pick up a U.S. Senate seat, take it out of the hands of people who've voted in, in a radical fashion for Joe Biden's disastrous policies, and get it back in the hands of a Republican who will go to Washington, D.C., and help set things on the right path. We have a movement that never died from our governor's race. This movement has grown stronger. It's actually national now, and people are very supportive of me as an America First candidate. And so I'm going to take the skills God has given me, the movement, the people, and we're going to take that to Washington, D.C. But in Arizona, are you running against Joe Biden or are you running against Kirsten Cinema? I think Joe Biden is an albatross that Kirsten Cinema and Ruben Gallego must wear around their neck because they have voted with him nearly 100% of the time. Can you imagine a man who has led this country down a path of total destruction and those two in Washington, D.C., rather than representing the people of Arizona and doing the right thing, have been voting in lockstep with him? Okay. So, uh, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> I know. Son of a gun. Let me... I'm getting too old, Carrie. I'm I, really I, sorry. Mark, I'm right there with you. No, you're Technology. not, girl. Um, no, <laughs> in this I'm race, like, uh. in this race, I'm way ahead. <laughs> I am way ahead. So let me go back again. Well, let, let me, while you're looking through your notes, I mean, for example, the majority of Arizonans want President Trump's border wall to be completed ASAP. And both Ruben Gallego and Kirsten Cinema have voted against funding the border wall time and time again. They voted against anything that would keep this invasion at our border from being abated. And that's a problem. This wide open border is causing uh, not only uh, problems with uh, crime and national security, we've got people coming in that we don't even know who they are, pouring across the border. 150,000 in three months came across Arizona's border. That's bigger than the population okay. of Coconino County. All right. So you, you want the wall built. What other specific proposals do you have? Because, you know, cinema has been down at that border ad nauseum, and she's worked closely with the same people, you know, the sheriffs, the communities, to try. And she is at odds with Biden on a lot of things. What, what would you do What that would change that, that would make a a substantive change to how folks are living their lives right now along Arizona's and, for that matter, Texas's border. Well, I'm a little um, sad that you fall in for her charade, which is now all of a sudden Kirsten Cinema comes to Arizona right before an election and acts like she's concerned about the border. She's not been. If she was concerned about the border, she would have voted to fund President Trump's border wall. Border walls work. If they didn't work, Joe Biden wouldn't have welded the doors open on the border wall here in Arizona. So if she really cared about the border, you would be able to look at her voting record and say she was doing something. She would have been standing up saying, we need to get President Trump's border policies back in action that Joe Biden pulled away on day one of his administration. So this is really a ruse. This is Kirsten the chameleon coming in on election cycle saying, oh, wow, I care about the border suddenly. So let's not fall for that because she's going to try to fool the people of Arizona. She's been very radical on the border. We need to finish President Trump's wall. We need to change our asylum rules so that people can't come here and claim asylum when it comes to leaving a country because of high crime. That's actually one of the ways you can come here and seek asylum. You know what? They're coming to America and frankly, we are a country with high crime. And so we need to remove that. We need to hire many more, hundreds, possibly thousands of more judges, and bring down the courts down to the border and process these people immediately, move them in, process them for okay. their asylum, and move them back out. Because we cannot afford to have seven, eight, nine, ten million people pour across with no vetting. And now their court dates are 12 years down the line. That means they're going to be staying here for 12 years. These are many of them, most of them, fraudulent asylum cases. And frankly, we can't afford this. Look at what's happening in New York City and many of these blue states and blue cities where even Democrats now are saying, wait a minute, you're putting up thousands of people in this hotel illegally? I can't even afford my rent. And we're paying for them to be here illegally. It's not fair to the American people. 
We have a legal immigration system, a legal immigration system that's very generous and very compassionate. And a lot of people who've gone through that are livid watching these people not just cut the line, walk straight into America and act like they're going to stay here forever. Okay. I think we got border. What are some of the other key issues you think are important, not only to Arizonans, but to, our, but to the nation that you, would, that you would want to tackle? There's so many. I mean, sadly, we have just a lot of very serious issues, one of them being the economy. And, you know, Joe Biden on day one, hour one, did two just disastrous things. His decision making is so bad. He opened up the border, basically pulled back everything President Trump had done. And, and you've been covering the border for a long time, Mark. I know you and I have been here almost as long as you know each other. And we covered the border. It was never more safe and secure than under President Trump. On day one, Joe Biden pulled that back. And at the same time, he stopped the Keystone XL pipeline. And he actually pulled back all of the amazing energy policy that President Trump had put into place so we could drill for natural gas and oil and be energy independent. And what that did was uh, set us on a collision course for disaster. Our national security is now at risk because we are now dependent once again on the Middle East. I don't want to be dependent on the Middle East, and I don't believe Arizonans do either for energy when we have plenty of oil right below our feet and natural gas. And so we're going to get that going quickly, and that's going to improve the economy. Give me an idea of how you do that. How you do that? You yeah, as, as a senator, how do you change policy, energy policy in this state, so that folks don't have to pay five dollars a gallon? Well, I think this is why we need to win this seat back and get it in Republican hands, because then we'll have the majority and we can get legislation passed that will basically take what President Trump had done policy-wise and put it into legislation so that we never have to worry about our American oil, American natural gas, American energy sector being the victim of a radical president, again, who's going to shut it all down. We've got to start drilling. We have the ability. We have plenty of oil below our feet. And when he did that, you know, that didn't just hurt the natural gas and oil industry. It made our gas prices spike up almost overnight. And what happens when our gas prices spike and go up and stay up? Everything that we truck across this country, food, clothing, all kinds of products, the prices go up. That was part of why our inflation shot up, and it doesn't have to be that way. We can actually drill and be energy independent, frankly, energy dominant, and then we have a lot more sway when it comes to making deals with other countries because we can be selling them energy, selling them oil. I also want to work as a senator to push nuclear energy. It's clean, it's effective. We can't keep pushing this green agenda that is actually destroying our, our jobs and our, and, and our economy. You know, when we shut down the Keystone XL pipeline, that's a lot of high paying jobs that are now gone. Immediately when we bring this back, we're going to have thousands of high paying jobs, which are American families. When you ship all of our oil overseas, or when you, when you get us reliant rather on overseas oil and overseas energy, we don't have those jobs here. So immediately we're going to have more jobs in the energy sector, and those are high paying jobs. We're going to see gas prices go down. We'll see, uh, I believe, we'll see inflation go down as well. Talk to me about abortion. When you ran for governor, um, you had, uh, you know, we talked about this. And you, you had said what you wanted to do as governor was have a policy that gave women, young girls who uh, may become impregnated, options other than abortion. You wanted yeah. to uh, allow them that opportunity, but you supported um, the kind of draconian uh, uh, free statehood law that was uh, they were talking about. I noticed that there is a slight change in your view today. Um, that uh, Explain to me kind of the evolution of where you are from when you ran for governor to where you are today as a senator and what and what um, why you, you know, everybody's entitled. I haven't to changed, change. actually, haven't? No. no. Okay. You know, I, I think I said to you, and, and you can look back at interviews, I mean, I support women and babies. I'm, I'm from a family of eight girls, and we've got lots, lots of nieces and nephews, and I think motherhood is the greatest gift. And I challenge you to ask, find any mother out there who won't tell you that no matter how difficult the pregnancy was or uh, raising the, the kids, 
it, it is the greatest gift, the greatest joy in her life was being a mother. And so I support trying to save as many babies as possible. But what I said as governor was, I'm running for governor, not emperor. I don't write the laws, the legislature, legislature writes the laws. And as the chief executive of the state, you uphold the laws. And so that's how I feel. I, I believe that abortion laws should be written at the state level. This is why many people wanted the repeal of the unconstitutional Roe v. Wade. And the, the state should write the abortion laws. And then the executive should uphold the laws. That's how it works. That's how the system works. But what I really take issue with is the Democrats who are trying to say they're pro-choice. They have a real funny way with using words. I don't really understand what choices they're giving women when they're only giving them one choice when they walk into an abortion clinic. And frankly, it is the most tragic choice. I believe we need to give women real choices. Let them know there are options for financial help if you feel you can't afford the baby. And let me tell you, a lot more women right now feel they can't afford a baby when they get pregnant. And maybe they don't really want an abortion, but they don't feel they can afford a baby in this economy. And how sad, can you imagine you walk into an abortion clinic, you don't feel you can afford your baby, you have an abortion, you go home and turn the news on, only to see that our lawmakers have sent another 10 or 20 or 30 billion dollars over to Ukraine. So we need to put our money where our mouth is as Republicans and actually support options for women who find themselves in that tragic place standing in the door of an abortion clinic and give them real options. Tell them about adoptive services that are out there. If they don't feel they can raise the baby, there are other women and, and families out there who would be willing to do that. I don't want to see women making that tragic choice. I'd like to actually give them true options so they can make a better choice. So if Arizona, the courts in Arizona decide that the, the law that the legislature passed a year or so ago, 15 weeks, and they, and they uphold that as opposed to the territorial law, you, would, you support that. Is that my, well, what you know, I'm, I'm running here? for U.S. Senate now, and right. that's the legislature's choice. And if the representation, these are people who are voted in by the people of Arizona, make that the law, then that will be the law of Arizona. That's how it works. As a senator, I won't get to come into Arizona and tell them what to do. And so I believe each state should make that decision, and then they should uphold the law. And I think give women options so that they can make the best choice, and uh, and hopefully we'll save some babies. Listen. In Hungary, they never changed a single abortion law, and they cut the number of abortions in half. That's amazing. And you know how they did that? By giving women choices, by helping women to be able to raise babies. They actually gave them baby bonuses. If you got married, you got a little bit of a tax break. If you had a baby, you got a little bit of a cut. If you, got, if you had another baby, if you have four babies in Hungary, a woman doesn't pay taxes again. That's a pretty great bonus. You know, we give a lot of bonuses to big corporations, but we never think of helping out families. And families are struggling right now. I can't even imagine, and it, it, it brings tears to my eyes, that somebody would find themselves walking into an abortion clinic, choosing to take the life of their baby, not because they want to, but because they don't feel they can afford to raise their child. You're a father. I'm a mother. The greatest gift I have are my children, and I'm so thankful I didn't have to face that decision. And if we can help women and families, then I think we're, uh, we're a better society for it. You brought this up kind of... Uh, and frankly, real quick, I'm really shocked that my Democrat opponents aren't for that. They're really for abortion right up until birth and even after birth. And both of them have voted on legislation when they were here in Arizona. Both of them voted to not provide a baby who would survive an abortion medical help choosing rather to let that baby die on a cold metal tray. I think that's barbaric. Uh, to that point, I, first of all, I don't think that has ever happened in Arizona, but um, I'll let you say what, well, what you but, believe. But it, it has happened in the past. Maybe it hasn't happened in Arizona. I'm not sure about that fact, but it has happened before. Babies have survived abortion. And there's one who speaks uh, very eloquently for the pro-life movement right now, and I can't think of her name, but you should research it. She did survive an abortion. Okay. You talked about, in a word, Ukraine. Many on your side, the Republican side, certainly the uh, majority leader in the, or the president of the Senate, Mr. McConnell, 
supports aid to Ukraine, sees it important as a way to keep U.S. troops from entering that conflict or later in places like Poland or Georgia or, or elsewhere. Um, you kind of suggested that you would be opposed to aid to Ukraine. Explain why you feel that I way. didn't kind of suggest that. I have very, very strongly suggested that. The American people don't want one more penny going to Ukraine. And there's no accountability for that money. We know that that money was going to pay first responders in Ukraine, to pay into their pension program. That's not fair for Americans. This is our treasure. America is falling to pieces right now, and we can't afford to continue this war in Ukraine. The fastest way to end the war in Ukraine is to stop funding it. And when you stop funding it and you are a true leader, if Joe Biden was a true leader, he would talk to both Zelensky and Putin and say, let's get to the, the peace talk table. Let's talk peace and let's end this thing. But we don't have a true leader right now. We have Joe Biden, and I know President Trump on day one will bring those men to the table and say, let's start talking peace here. We're on the verge of World War III right now. We may already be in it. And I talk to the people of Arizona more than probably any other politician in Arizona, because I'm out there and the people know me. They are not for sending any more money to Ukraine. And, and the last I heard, when you get elected and when you're running, you're representing the people of America, of Arizona, not the people of Ukraine. And lately it seemed like a lot of these lawmakers appear to be representing the people of Ukraine and giving um, the middle finger, frankly, to the people of America. But again, this, you know, I know what the Democrats feel, but, but the Republican majority leaders in the Senate support aid to Ukraine because they see it as a way to keep the United States out of a conflict. You, and again, you don't see that's it that That's their way. opinion, and they're welcome to have that opinion. I'm, I'm telling you what the people of Arizona tell me and the people around the country. And they're tired of funding these wars and getting entangled in, in foreign wars. And, you know, there's not a lot of money in peace. But the war machine makes not billions, but trillions on war. Trillions. And they're con that's why we're constantly... Uh, the war machine wants to have a bunch of wars going. And I think the people of this great nation are tired of getting involved in war overseas. Okay. I really do. Israel, your thoughts about that? Um, we're giving them aid, um, and, and uh, you support that? What was that? Israel, your support. Uh, our I, government I support. I mean, we're giving them aid. Oh, we're, we're helping them out. Um, you know, do you support that? Are we doing policy-wise, is the U.S. government right now following a path that you would agree with or not uh, regarding how we're dealing with that situation in the Middle East? I think we have to bring down every terrorist organization um, wherever possible. What happened to the people of Israel on October 7th is some of the most barbaric uh, acts of terror that I've ever seen in my life. I, I watched one or two videos. I have not been able to watch any more. Uh, anybody who watched what happened to the people of Israel in that coordinated attack that was funded by Iran should be horrified. And Israel has the absolute right to protect its citizens. Frankly, they have the duty to protect their citizens. And Hamas is, is one of the most uh, barbaric terrorist organizations that the globe has ever known. And I think they need to bring down Hamas, absolutely, 100%. And I think what we need to do as Americans is stop helping Iran grow and prosper. The Ayatollah is not only uh, pushing, he's a, a warmonger and he, he's for terror, he's hurting his own people. The people of Iran are struggling under his le leadership, and I, I hate to use that, that phrase. It's really a dictatorship. And we need to, we need to actually uh, bleed them dry of the money they have. And unfortunately, Joe Biden and Ruben Gallego supported it, the Iran deal, the one that President Trump ripped up. They brought it back. It has allowed Iran to make 80 to $100 billion selling their oil. We had Iran in a very poor state. We had the Ayatollah and his entire uh, leadership in a very poor state where they could not fund terror. And now they have billions of dollars to fund terror. And Joe Biden gave them even more 
by freeing up that $8 billion, which I believe that money went directly to Hamas to fund this attack. I don't want Americans to have, I don't want the American government or the American people to have blood on their hands. And if our administration is helping to fund Iran, which is then funding terror around the globe, we have blood on our hands. And we don't want, we, we want peace. And we had peace under President Trump. We had the Abraham Accords. You and I both grew up in a world where we were told we, you could never have peace in the Middle East. It, it just was kind of a given. And here we get President Trump in there, and he works diligently to bring peace to the Middle East. We had the Abraham Accords signed, and, and we need to get somebody in the White House. And frankly, we need people in the Senate and in Congress who want to see peace in the world. Okay. And that means you got to get people who are not funded by the lobbyists for the military industrial complex. On, on the six billion you were talking about, that's currently in a banking cutter. It's dedicated only to humanitarian purposes and none of it's been spent. Okay, but Mark, if Iran has eight billion dollars and is for humanitarian, that means that's money they don't have to spend on humanitarian that can then go okay. to terror. All right, I just want to just Put that out there. It's like somebody gave you six hundred dollars, a uh, a gift card for groceries, okay? And you, then you said, "Well, great, that's going to help me pay for groceries and humanitarian for my family." Okay. That means I can take my other money and do other things with it, and that is freeing up more money for Iran to spend funding Hamas. And Hamas is uh, we saw what they're capable of right. on October seventh, killing babies, torturing babies torturing the elderly, burning people alive, chopping off the heads of babies. I mean, I, you know what happened over there. And for yeah. people to criticize Israel for trying to respond to that, I mean, they really have to look deep in their soul and ask if that's the right move. Let me swing back now to the campaign. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn running for governor that you're applying now or considering applying now for your run for Senate? What, did you, what were the lessons that you think um, you can now apply to your future as you run for U.S. Senate? Oh, I learned so much on the campaign trail. I learned so much being with the people of Arizona for 525 days and hearing um, what their aspirations were what their concerns were, what kept them up at night. I feel that I have a, a great sense of what the people of Arizona are concerned about. And I learned that they're, they're really, really hungering for elected officials who are just gonna do the right thing, who are just in it for the right reason. And so I'm gonna take that understanding of the people, understanding of the issues, and I'm gonna take that now to the U.S. Senate. And at the same time, in, in a really great way, I think I can not only help the people of Arizona, but the people of America, because Americans are struggling. Th this reckless spending that, you know, Kirsten Cinema and Ruben Gallego have rubber stamped that Joe Biden's, you know, pushing, is killing us. It's killing us. It's look at our economy. Look at 33 trillion in debt, and so the people are really struggling right now. And I, I learned that they need someone, in, in really every office, from school board up to governor, up to senate, up to the president, who's finally going to put the people first. I think we ran an incredible campaign. I disagree if uh, people say we didn't bring people together. We did. I, I get stopped all the time by Democrats and independents who say, oh my gosh, I never casted a vote for a Republican until you were on the ballot. I love what you stand for. Thank you for fighting. Thank you for not giving up on us. And so I'm just going to take that same fight um, my, my love for this state, and I'm going to switch it over to U.S. Senate, and we're going to do great things for the people of Arizona. But what did Carrie Lake learn about Carrie Lake? Oh, interesting. Uh, you know what? I learned that uh, I'm a little tougher than I thought I was. <laughs> I've always thought I was tough because I grew up in a big family, and when you're in a big family, you have to do a lot for yourself. You can't rely on, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. If we wanted anything, we had to work for it. And I'm talking, if we wanted toothpaste and shampoo, we had to work for it in my house. And so I've always had a great work ethic, and it's really hard to get me down. I'm, I'm a pretty positive person, actually. Media doesn't always portray me that way. But 
I've learned that, you know, I've faced a lot of strife in the last year. And it's not just me, Arizonans, Americans are. But personally, what happened to us in that last election was very difficult. And I've learned that I can just get up and plow right through every day. I hit the, my feet hit the ground and I just say, thank you, God, for another day and use me as you see fit. And I really did pray. My husband, Jeff, and I, we prayed a lot about whether to jump into this race. Okay. And we realized that um, we really, I think we're here for this moment. And I mean you and I mean everybody out there watching. God placed us at this pivotal moment in history to be the people that turn this around and that save our country. I, I'm worried that our country is on its last months, not even last year's, last months. I don't know how much more we can survive. So we need some fighters in there. I learned that I'm a hell of a lot tougher than I even thought I was. Well, let me ask you, um, and these will be the last couple of questions. Okay. Um, are you acknowledging now or coming to terms now with the fact that uh, Katie Hobbs is the governor and you're not. Well, she's sitting in the governor's office, unfortunately for the people of Arizona. And I'm continuing and I've never quit my court cases. We have three of them and I'm moving forward with them. And I know that many people out there don't want to see that, but the vast majority of people do want me to move those cases through. We need to make sure that we have reform in our elections so that every voter feels confident their vote counts. And that's what I want. That's why I'm, I'm pushing my cases forward. I don't know where they'll go. I don't know if at the end of the day we'll win those cases, but I want to see them through. And I, and I had the right to do that. And the people have asked me to do that. Okay. So no concession, just to be clear. There, no. That doesn't sound like a concession to me. No, absolutely not. Now, uh, m more to, the, to today uh, in recent weeks, you have three uh, former President Trump's election attorneys pleading guilty in Georgia, saying they lied, that they made up all of this stuff about election fraud, voting machines, that sort of thing. Do you feel betrayed for someone who is out there on the front lines defending um, Donald Trump's, uh, you know, statements that he was robbed, that he had the election stolen from him, and now three people who were behind him and influencing him and uh, giving him advice are now saying they lied. It's not true. I'm just curious I, well, as to your thoughts when yeah. you hear that. I, I, in a way, I understand because what I see happening is the weaponization of our government against anybody who speaks out, asks questions, and um, is concerned about our elections. And I understand some of them are facing um, many hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in fees for attorneys. Some of them can't even find attorneys who are willing to take the cases because the attorneys themselves will be disbarred or have a threat to their legal license. There's a real push for not even allowing us to ask questions of our government and our elections officials. So I think some of them may have done that just to avoid having to go through the incredible stress and hassle of lawfare. And that's what we're seeing here. It's called lawfare. It's weaponizing the legal system to harass somebody practically to death. And so, no, I, I, I understand. I mean, Sidney Powell did that. She's got a beautiful grandbaby. I think she's facing some health problems. And that's a lot of stress for somebody. And so, you know, everyone's got to do what they have to do. But for me, I am doing what the people of Arizona have asked me to do. Many of them have said, please don't give up on us. We want to make sure that in the future our votes count and that they really truly do count. One legal vote per legal voter, and we can rest assured that the results are meaningful and true. And that's all I want. Okay, so you, you don't believe you were lied to by those folks, those lawyers? No, I saw what happened in the election, and I am concerned if we do not address these issues. You know, this is the problem. So many issues we've had that we just kick the can down the road, ignore it, let's not deal with it, it's too hard. And what's happened is that's how we've gotten here. The political elite have just been, um, you know, dereliction of duty, really, and what they're supposed to be out there working for the people. They just take all the hard issues and they ignore them, and then they become bigger and bigger problems. So I don't feel that I was lied to. I've actually um, taken a look at a lot of the evidence out there, 
and I know what happened. And I know that this is not something the media is willing to dig into because the media doesn't do a good job. They don't care. But I have, and I understand what happened, and it's my legal right to continue my cases. And so I will. But at the same time, I'm a multitasker. I'm a mom. I can, do, I, I can pack lunches. I can look at homework. I can, you know, get the kids ready and pick out, help them pick out their clothes and get them out the door and hold the job and do, you know, budgeting. That's how moms operate. I can do more than one thing at one time. And I'm going to continue the cases while I run for the United States Senate. And we're going to give the people of Arizona some hope that they can get somebody in office who actually will put their needs and concerns first and who will put America first. We've been putting America last under this president, under Ruben Gallego, and under Kirsten Sinema. And we need somebody who's going to go to Washington, D.C., who's got a backbone, who's got fight, and who's going to put America first. Thanks. Thank you, Mark.